Without some understanding of history and geography, there are so many stories that we hear that we would never fully grasp. If, for example, I tell you about standing in front of the Twin Towers when I was young, you understand that that story has a deeper meaning because you know something about history and geography. Or if I say something stretches from the Atlantic to the Pacific, you know what I'm saying because you understand something about geography. Or if I tell you a young man spent his 20s spending every night on the Las Vegas Strip, you can begin to picture his life because you know something about that place. And the problem for many of us when we read this passage today from 2 Kings is that we miss the point of this story because we simply don't know much about this geography and this history. So today I want us to take a little historical and geographical journey around the Holy Land as we explore this passage. It won't be too academic. The message of today's reading is conveyed through four places that have geographical and historical significance. Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and the River Jordan. And the underlying question of this whole reading is through the various chapters of our lives, through the various places that life will take us, will we remain steadfast and consistent in our commitment to follow God? Before jumping into this lesson, I want to tell you a little story about a man who went through some very different stages in life, a story that will help put our Holy Land journey into context. C.S. Lewis was born into a Christian household in Belfast in November 1898. His mother died when he was very young, and Lewis, like so many of his generation, was deeply impacted by the violence and the horror of World War I, the pain of losing his mother and the violence that he glimpsed from this war created in him a deep skepticism, a, a deep doubt about religion. As a student at Oxford, C.S. Lewis became an atheist. However, he wasn't satisfied. He had a deep yearning for something. He just didn't know what that was. Despite all the pain and the brokenness he saw in the world, he also saw goodness and love. So he began to have conversations with people about faith, especially conversations with his good friend J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings. And these conversations began to challenge C.S. Lewis's assumptions and began to ignite a deep spiritual and an intellectual exploration of the questions of faith. Despite his doubt, and despite his uncertainty about religion and about God, Lewis didn't get stuck in that place of doubt. He continued to ask questions and to explore his faith. The passage we read today from the Old Testament begins with the declaration Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. You will certainly remember that, that Moses led the Hebrew people out of Egypt. He led them then as they wandered for 40 years. He guided them through tumultuous times. But before crossing into the promised land, Moses died. And the Hebrew people were at a loss. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know who to turn to. They didn't know who to follow. They were filled with uncertainty. They were filled with doubt. When they crossed the river into the promised land, despite the uncertainty and despite the doubt, we read that they, might, they made a pile of rocks and they began looking towards the future. And they called this place Gilgal. Gilgal is a place of uncertainty. 
we read, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. They were traveling from a place of uncertainty. And Elijah turned to Elisha and said to his protege, stay here. But Elisha responded, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. In other words, Elisha was saying that he wouldn't remain in a place of doubt and uncertainty. I'm convinced that we all have our own Gilgals. We have periods in our lives when we are overwhelmed by uncertainty. And the question we're asked, and the question Elisha is answering is, even in the face of doubt and uncertainty, will you continue doing your best to follow God? Or will you give up and get stuck? Elisha's answer, I will not leave you. He declared his commitment to continue moving forward and to continue this journey. C.S. Lewis's journey from doubt to faith was not a sudden revelation, but a sort of gradual awakening. After years and, and months of wrestling with his doubts and uncertainties, he did experience a transformation, a conversion. He said that he was overwhelmed by the compelling truth of the Christian faith. C.S. Lewis's life took another unexpected turn when he formed a deep connection with a woman named Joy Gresham. Initially, their relationship was based on shared intellectual interests, but it blossomed into a romance. Lewis found that his life was filled with contentment and joy. Bethel is the second place Elijah takes Elisha on this spiritual pilgrimage. It was at Bethel, you may remember, that Jacob had a dream. And in this dream, he saw a ladder stretching from earth to heaven and angels ascending and descending this ladder. And in Jacob's dream, God told Jacob that Jacob would be blessed. Bethel was a place of blessing and peace and joy. You see, for many of us, we're most likely to stop following God, not when things are going poorly, but when things are going well in our lives. Contentment and peace can be a phenomenal distraction. It's easy to turn to God when things aren't going our way and say, oh God, just throw me a lifeline. The problem with being content is that we can forget why we have found contentment and peace. And then the little distractions begin to creep in in our lives. Yes, you are committed to spending time with God, but wouldn't it be nice to get a round of golf in this Sunday, even if it means skipping church? There are a few too many laughs at that joke. <laughs> yes, you're committed to serving others, but instead of giving money to a charitable organization, wouldn't it be wonderful to go on that dream vacation this year? Yes, you're committed to praying first thing in the morning, but if I go into the office an hour earlier, I can pull ahead of the competition a little bit. And what may be even more dangerous when we're in the stages of life where we're most content is that we attribute all our success to ourselves. Look at what I accomplished, we say. In short, we face the question, will we follow God even when we're comfortable? Even when it feels like we don't really need God's help right now? Even when it seems like everything is going great in our lives? Elijah's answer, I will not leave you. Elisha's answer, I mean. Contentment and peace are very pleasant places to find ourselves, but we need to make sure they never obscure our commitment to our faith and our commitment to follow God. 
C.S. Lewis was very comfortable. He was in love. His career as a professor was taking off. And then tragedy struck in his life. Joy was diagnosed with cancer, and in 1960, C.S. Lewis was devastated at her death. Suffering can also cause people to give up their faith. But Lewis instead channeled his grief into a renewed commitment to his faith. He began to write more expansively on questions like faith and morality and theology and God, despite Lewis's pain, he grew in his commitment to communicate and to share and to show God's love and God's grace. <clears throat> the third place that Elijah led Elisha in this pilgrimage was to Jericho. When the Hebrew people had entered the promised land, there were already people living there. And these people were not too keen to give up their land. And the first city that the Hebrew people encountered was Jericho. Jericho was a walled city, and the people within the city refused to surrender. Eventually, the walls were torn down, and the Hebrew people claimed the city. But to this day, Jericho is associated with ideas of wars and violence and suffering and pain. You may think that wars and violence, well, that's something far off in the world. You may think that suffering and pain, well, that's in Somalia and Africa where people are starving to death, but not here in Jacksonville. And I would say, really? Just last year, 400 people were shot in this city. We live in a world of violence and suffering and pain, and it touches all of our lives. In your life, you may be suffering. Like C.S. Lewis, maybe someone you love has died. Or maybe it's not just suffering. Maybe there's also violence bound up with this suffering. Maybe you have a business partner who's gone her own way and is now disparaging you to her clients. We all face these sorts of situations and we can get so angry, so determined to win whatever fight we see in front of us that we ignore the principles of our faith. We think, yes, I want to follow Jesus, but first I need to win this battle. First I need to beat this person. First I need to overcome this adversary. And the question we face in this reading from 2 Kings is regardless of the violence or the suffering or the pain in our lives, will we choose to continue to follow God? When Elisha could have chosen to remain in Jericho, this place of suffering and violence, he instead declared to Elijah, I will follow you. And ultimately, the question for all of us is whether we will remain committed to following God, whether we will continue to declare, I will not leave you through the uncertain times in our lives, through the prosperous times, through even the times of suffering and pain. Due to his faithfulness, Elisha eventually followed Elijah to the River Jordan. Of course, the River Jordan was theologically significant for the Hebrew people, but even more so for us as followers of Jesus who look back on this event, we see a deeper meaning as Elisha walked into the River Jordan and then came out the other side and the Spirit of God descended on him. After all, it was in the River Jordan that Jesus walked, and he was baptized, and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. You see, the Jordan River reminds us of our baptism, of new life in Christ, of the work that we are each given to do. 
as C.S. Lewis neared the end of his life, he reflected back and wrote, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ. If they are not doing that, these are C.S. Lewis's words, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, and even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. And because of C.S. Lewis's steadfast commitment through each of the sequential chapters of his life, he did just that. He accomplished just that. He helped others encounter the love of God and be transformed by God's grace. And in the end, because of Elisha's faithfulness, he saw this glorious vision as Elijah was ascending into heaven amidst this whirlwind on a chariot of fire. And because of that, he received a double portion of Elijah's spirit, a spirit that propelled him to feed the hungry and cure the sick and demonstrate God's love. Elisha's life was given meaning and purpose. And this is the invitation for each of us also. We are invited to remain committed to God during the times of uncertainty and doubt, during the times of prosperity and joy, even during the times when we face suffering and violence. Elijah, after all, repeatedly declared, I will not leave you. And we are invited to make the same declaration to God. However, it is worth remembering that the more profound truth is not our declaration to God. The more important truth is that regardless of the stage in life where we find ourselves, it is God who will look at us and say, I will not leave you. I will not leave you. Amen.